Okay, uh, we are already live. So, hi, Eric. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for joining the FAO Academy recitations. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, connecting with Shenzhen is very important for us, and also connecting with the, with the work that you are doing in Seed Studio and with the Maker Movement, not only in Shenzhen, but in China. Um, uh, it's going to be a nice session. Uh, students are learning how to make circuit boards. So I think it's, per it's a perfect timing. And, and also, it's a good opportunity to start to see some products that could be developed in the FabLab network that can go and maybe plant a seed uh, somewhere, somewhere else with you. That I, that I know that it's not only in China. Um, so yeah, I think that with that, I leave you all the audience. We have the whole FabLab network around 600 fab labs in the world, but especially the fab academy students, more than 300 students uh, this year joining the program. So thank you, Eric Pang, for joining us. The world is yours. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, hello, all the fab lab students and teachers. It's a huge pleasure to be hosting the uh, lecture today. And we're in the middle of our factory in Shenzhen. Surrounding us is a silent factory because it's uh, middle night here in China. And I also have some guests who are the Fab Lab students from the Shenzhen. You will see them say hello to the people. And uh, um, I will try to squeeze my lecture into one and a half an hour because I prepared for about two hours. Um, let me share my screen first. <coughs> so um, it's, a, it's a huge pleasure and also a big um, pressure for me to prepare for the contents. I know it's it's a bit uh, remote it's, and it's also a bit uh, difficult because we also always say that hardware is hard, manufacturing always cause problems. Um, I hope through this lecture I can give you a glimpse of what's happening back here in the center of manufacturing and give you some senses how to design from manufacturers and I will also share all the pains and gains to the many projects we have done. So, um, are we all good, Tomas? Yes, perfect. Uh, okay. uh, screen sharing working perfectly. Okay, go ahead. So, my topic today as a sign is electronic manufacturing. Um, hold on. Okay, this is uh, me. I'm Eric Pan, and I'm founder of Seed, and also uh, a lot of other things. Because we have done so many things, we try to categorize what is uh, Seed and uh, how our business runs. We are seeing the maker community like an ecosystem, and we are playing as one tree of it. So we provide open source modules for people to do prototyping. But what we are going to talk more today is how we help people to manufacture in small volumes. And also, we help to promote the culture, promote the community. And you will find out more by Googling us. First, I'd like to give you a, not a short interview overview, because I think it's very important to uh, have a different mindset growing from one piece to many pieces. Uh, we have a lot of workshops about prototyping, but just two little workshops about how to manufacture things. So if we look at the world in the open hardware perspective, it's more like uh, the pyramid. So all the makers, they have ideas. Everybody has ideas. But whenever you uh, bring them into prototype, you become the maker. You're actually growing from 0 to 0 0.1. But you have to go further sometimes to have the first working engineering sample. You become a very veteran maker. I think a lot of Fab Lab uh, students are working uh, towards this, like I see. From last lesson, you have done some uh, PCB uh, by CNC, uh, and then you'll be soldering your own uh, devices first. But uh, today, we are going to cover how to grow from one piece to like 1,000 pieces. Whenever you have 1,000 pieces manufactured, you are actually becoming an independent product maker. You can call yourself a hardware startup because you are not making one product for yourself. You're actually benefiting uh, a larger audiences. If all stars aligns, if everything goes perfect, you might want to wrap up to 10,000 pieces. That's where the mass production actually happens. 
if it goes beyond that, you're actually uh, bridging with traditional industrial resources. It's a huge gap between zero to 10,000 pieces, but uh, I think by st step by st step, all the uh, barriers are lowered. Now everybody in um, all kinds of backgrounds can manufacture their own creations. And uh, I believe a lot of you guys can make your own banner joint, but how to make an army? How to make an army that performance is the same? They can, um, how do you manufacture all the bad droids with uh, some special setup of uh, uh, equipment, human beings, and also, more importantly, the supply chains? And I'll help you to make a bad droid, but uh, I think the concepts are basically the same. If we disassemble uh, electronic hardware, you might see several um, layers. If we compare them to animals, it's like skin, skeleton, gut, and so. A lot of you might be very familiar with so, which is software, which has a logic, has the behaviors inside. But it has to work on some hardware, which is the uh, electronics part, the circuits. And also you have need to have the skeleton, the st structure to um, protect and form the body. And you need to make it good looking by the um, outer finish and also the packages. So if we want to um, manufacture in small volumes or bigger volumes, we are actually um, duplicating each of the layers. The electronics is, will be the focus for today, but uh, you might very well know how to copy, download, paste the firmware into different devices. And also uh, you will learn in the Fab Academy how to make the, fab, the mechanic parts. And also you have many ways to do the enclosure. So after we disassemble the hardware, we, on each of the layers, we will see these uh, four steps. You start with the design. You have your idea, you turn it into a, a file. Then you need to pay prayer for the um, materials. You need to collect the materials in the same place at the same time. And then you actually start to produce and assemble them all into one piece that can actually work. Then you need to package them into a very nice finish to send to yourself or your audiences. None of this process is easy because you need to balance between the three elements. The cost, the quality, and the schedule. They are very much intertwined. If you change the cost, you might affect the quality. If, if you want to push, pull in the schedule to deliver to the mass to the market faster, you might increase the cost, for example. Let's uh, go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, <clears throat> if we talk about the quality. What is the quality? Um, there's no absolute high quality things. Quality is actually an expectation. How do you expect to get from the product? If we look at first and the right uh, chart, you will see a lot of dots. Because the word itself is analog, the word itself is very random. You will you manufacture the same products with the same uh, setup, same material. You might also have some randomness, thanks to the quantum physics or anything beyond that. But what we are need to focus on is to control the result into our inside our expectations there are so many ways to do that there are so many factors will affect contribute to the defects um, there are so many um, systems knowledge is behind that but we need to um, understand that quality is equal be from the design to manufacture to deliver deliverable the only matter is how do you promise to deliver and how do you achieve it so it can be affected by personnel who operates it, the materials, how to me measurement to evaluate, and also what kind of machines you are using, the methods you're using, and also the environment might also affect the, the quality. And, uh, and it might be a very nightmare for a lot of hardware startups because the schedule 
is always uh, unstable. You, we have already seen so many Kickstarter campaigns they might delay for even more than one year, even cancel. So for the schedule, uh, for the manufacturers, you have a lot of components they need to or shall arrive on time. But the, supp the supply chain is very dynamic. For example, um, there might be some turmoil in some countries. For example, in Tianjin port in China, there were uh, explo explosive. And uh, the result is uh, in that port, by that time, there was an uh, OLED shipment. And they, t they totally destroyed in the disaster. So in the following a few months, we don't have enough OLED screens. No matter how good plan you have done, this kind of disasters are out of control. And the supply chain itself is not static and might change. So you need, we need to adapt to the changes. And also the production line has its queue. Because production line, the role, the, the goal is to keep running to uh, increase the utilization. They cannot wait for you forever. Whenever there is a new production comes, it usually needs to wait. Wait for the last batch to finish and start new ones. If there is any problem, it has to go back, wait again. And also, um, there are so many things that we don't know that we don't know that problems are totally unexpected. So because of the issues, before you give up, the project management is very serious. And the, the final thing I think is the cost. We always look at some electronics um, products and uh, we can tell the bio material cost. You see uh, how much is uh, microcontrollers, how much is uh, resistors, they don't look expensive. But we need to add a lot more cost into the manufacturing. Like <coughs> the manufacturing itself, like you need to do some tooling to, for the manufacturing. That might be some setup fee, but you need to uh, equalize them into the long-term manufacturings. But uh, what's worse is uh, behind the sea level. People, a lot of people don't know that they need to consider the cost of engineering. There are also so many um, cost on management. It's not only managing your team, it's also managing the supply chains, managing suppliers, managing all the disasters. Then you need to spend uh, uh, quite some cost for marketing. And also certifications, if you want to sell um, offline, that might be a good cost. And also logistic is becoming more expensive because of the um, ship hassles. And also um, because we are doing a lot of innovations, innovation costs because you make mistakes. The mistakes will generate defects. All the defects, they will be in your bills. So we need to be seeing them <coughs> very seriously. Do you guys want to have a break? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, first we, we start from design because that's everything starts. That's where the karma lies. We don't, um, I believe a lot of you have heard design for manufacturers because for the big companies, we usually come to the manufacturing side and they command the factories how to manufacture for them. They will also to take care of uh, all the details. But uh, I think for a lot of uh, uh, students like you, including the makers globally, our volume are very small. We are not big companies. We are not established players. We need to look at what's existing and to follow all the restraints to make our designs not only unique, but uh, visible. So I think for, the, for design, the most important sentence is be, respons be responsible for what you have started. We see so many designs they are delivered, but they will in the end might affect a lot of uh, processes afterwards, they might, in the end, af affect your product. We have heard a lot of words <coughs> for design, like DFX. If we categorize them into different phrases, like you might see, like devel developing phases, we need to design for short time to market, we need to consider for the reliability, 
we need to worry how to test them in the development or in the future. And then we need to worry about safety. We need to concern about how, to, how, we, how do we ensure quality. Now, we need to worry about damages, corrosions, like minimum risks. Finally, we can come to production operation freeze, but that's where a lot of problem happens. You need to worry about cost. You need to follow standards. You need to design for assembly, how to put them together quickly. And uh, you need to worry about manufacturability. Your good design does that mean a good design for the manufacturing side. And then you need to worry about logistics. How do you pack them to ship them globally? And what if there are some delays? And also you need to worry about how to assemble them for electronics, how to do them in low quantity. And for the users, you need to worry about the user friendliness. I believe there are a lot of designers who are very aware of that. But how about economics, aesthetics, how to service them, how to repair them, maintain, repair, reuse, recycle. Whenever you want to dispose, how do you worry about environment? How do you do recycling? How do you do remanufacturing? Please don't be frightened because I don't know of them. I got them from the Wikipedia page. We have a lot of issues because people come to the field like a software team. Um, software team is like a band. You, only, you might need only three or five people to come up with a design to make it uh, working and post them on iTunes. But for hardware, you actually need a, a big orchestra. You need a whole team with established knowledge of above issues about DFX. So a lot of team, they come to play orchestra with a band. That causes a lot of issues because of so many things that you don't know. You know nothing. It's slow because you know nothing. You didn't know so many things that the factories didn't know that you are not a professional as your previous customers. Because we are new comers to manufacturing, this caused a lot of problems because of the inequity of knowledge. But the remedy, I think, is we look at manufacturing, design from it. A very important tool, element inside of this is open hardware. We use a lot of open hardware for prototyping. Maybe on your table you have Arduino, you have Raspberry Pi, you have uh, so many open things. But it's also a perfect tool, perfect element for you to consider the supply chains. Because you're actually sharing the supply chain with the other people using the open hardware. And the, for next steps, I think we need to open source the manufacturing processes. So we will understand or the strengths by looking at the manufacturing process itself and come back to our laboratory to design something that matches the process. And I, I think that's a hope for Fab Lab and also what we are trying to do is to manufacture decentralized. It should be more like service to covering the different locations with the same process and materials. I think that's where we can make the DFX or manufacture much easier because by different teams, different pr products, we are actually training ourselves and sharing the knowledges among different projects. That's a big word, but let's see the details. So this is one example from our uh, friend called Garley. He has inspiration of, of the electronic eggs. He wants to use human beings as the, the electronic pets. So it's, he has the idea about 20 years ago, but he has, didn't have the tools to do that. Now, in 2012, he has open hardware. He tried to put together some modules to make the first prototype and a 3D print enclosure to make it working. And about um, three months later, he started to make engineering sample to shrink the size to work with the maker groups to uh, do a layout over again. And uh, after half a year, he finally can use crowdfunding and essence promotions to get the idea 20 years later into market. But you see, actually, the open hardware has facilitated the whole process. Because we are having more and more platforms to suit different uh, usages. And we have more uh, modular sensors, actuators, 
they are actually combined together to come up with a whole solution. And we will have more knowledge sharing and support from different channels, of course, including the city wiki. And also we have the project inspiration from instructables, from all people's blogs and tweeters. We are actually not only making the prototype easier, but looking at what people has done, has failed, has succeed, we can follow their passes to facilitate the way we manufacture new things. And also, thanks to the CD tools, they are becoming more easier to use, they are becoming free, and they are more like cloud-based. You can actually open some uh, cloud-based uh, CD tools and to uh, collaborate or find some uh, experts to help you. If we look at them into the two-dimensional uh, categorization, the, the upper ends to the right, they are more for beginners, they are more free, while on the far end uh, is Altium, they are more professional, expensive. So we will see more involvement of the tools. I cannot tell which one suits you because you need to try them themselves and to, ex to evolve with the community. Because uh, um, I think in the future, we don't need to have everyone get a very um, professional on how to design a circuit, but you try to reuse what's existing modules and try to come up with your own complementary circuits easily. And if we look at the PCB design process, it starts from need. What do you want to do to uh, accomplish? And you, whenever you have a concept, you can use some uh, open hardware, breakout board modules to validate. And you will then you will have the schematics to uh, map the, the electronics together and you do the layout to place the components to where they are going to be. And then you need to do the routing, verification. And whenever you, I think it's a very important process because that's before you manufacturing, you get your own board, like what you have done for the last session. You evaluate if it's the right design I, I want. But you also need to prepare for the following uh, procedures for manufacturing, for testing, for logistic, for everything. So if everything is perfect from what, I, uh, from what you have seen for the stage, we can move on to prepare. So we need to gather all the materials together If we uh, look at electronic products, I will show you some uh, examples just by my hand. But there are so many categories, we can start from a few. For electronic manufacturing, we majority of the products has to start with PCB. Uh, and also the pairing stencils for severe testing. One thing for that is quality. When you make the first PCB, it might be right, but whenever you manufacture it for several thousand pieces, there might be something wrong, like even for the printing of the secret screens. But I think for a lot of us, the major issues on, are on the components, both on the active and passive ones, like the ICs, like the resistors, capacitors, because you might meet issues on lead time and also quality. And for the laser risk ones are the standard mechanic components, like the rivets, the screws, nuts, and also for the standard accessories, they might be very low risk as, and, as well because it's very substitutional. And for the packaging materials, you need to consider it because it's part of, of your product. But it might also affect a lot on quality. The materials you use, the printing, the quality, the color, that might differ from what you have thinking. But what's worse, I, um, I might try to convince you not to do that, is customized parts. You might spend quite enough preparations and time because the, these customized parts, they might need to need time. They might delay the whole project, but more importantly, they might, call, they might cause tolerance issues. You will very soon meet that kind of issue whenever you have your uh, first enclosure to your uh, electronic board because then you, you might want to have enough buffers to make sure um, the large 
uh, massively customized paths, they are consistent, and uh, all the tolerances, tolerances, tolerances they can align to each other. And uh, if you really want to do injection molding, that's the most difficult one because you will spend a lot of money, and the lead time are usually over several months, and then you might in the end to cover with tolerances. Okay, don't get too frightened because we will see the build material template. This is very normal, very simple one. We don't have uh, so many items on it, but that's actually how do you describe the things on your electronic board. You might have seen the build materials, but in real manufacturing, if you give the task to someone on the other side of the planet, you might make sure everything is right, everything is clear, and make everything is reachable. I will send the slide later so you, you can look into the details yourself. But there are some hints for the biomaterial DFM. Please don't assume people know what they know. I, I've seen so many <laughs> biomaterials, they tell people, oh, here we need some screws. That's it. But how could I know what kind of screws you want unless I have the samples, unless I measure it? So don't assume people know. And you need to always have a plan B. What if the components you used, they are extinct? There are some, there are very usually we just take some components uh, on our desks, or sometimes we unsolder them from other pr product. But uh, that component might be extinct, unavailable. So try to have a plan B. And whenever you are um, preparing for the bone, please leave no room for ambiguity. You, you need to make sure if you are talking about IC, you including all the package details. Is if it's industrial grade or it's just something that works. You need to be very, very clear. Imagine that you are working with a computer without too good AI. And uh, you need to, in the long run, consider availability. We see so many projects that they, they use some components that just randomly, and in the end, they cannot get from the uh, suppliers. Or the suppliers might need several months to provide the ICs to them. Um, for small volume, that might be a less issue, because you always can find some small volume uh, ready stock. But if you are manufacturing several 10,000 pieces, one million of them, you need to make good relationship, good plan with your supplier. So beyond materials, they are very routine problem to your manufacturing problems. So we look at PCB. PCB are actually easy because they are very standardized and they are very digital. Whenever you bring a PCB into production, I think you will learn no Later in Fab Academy is to different layers, six screens, uh, shoulder mask, copper, etc. And uh, here's a video. If you don't have the, if you, the video is too much latency, you can uh, open the links on the end of the uh, slide. <laughs> So this is one way of manufacturing uh, PCB, but uh, there are new other ways besides the homebrew PCB. We will see, like Watera, they are trying to uh, like ink print the circuits, and we have other means, or you can use some desktop CNC to cut um, low precision PCB as well. But for PCB, we also have some hints for design for manufacturer. You need to look at the supplier's process spec. 
if your if your supplier is your um, CNC machine, you should look very carefully carefully on the precision it has. If you use some uh, uh, fab house to do the PCB, you need to look at their spec, and uh, you need to leave some buffer if possible because that will uh, increase the success, the yield of the PCB. And uh, whenever you're designing the PCB, you need to worry in the future how people can assemble the components in, onto the PCB. So you need to make sure the components that needs to be polarized must be marked clearly. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> okay, which, this is a pain for me. Because there are so many uh, projects that reversed components cause uh, defects. And also to make the life easier, you try to have the signature for each component. If you cannot put them onto the PCB itself, you better to have a paper printing the matching um, marks. And also, I think this is, this is something different, that the silk screen is very much more important for the open hardware world because we are usually shipping with a PCB only. So the secret screen has to be clear. But to do that uh, well, you need to control them in like six mil, six, six mil width and the 40 mil head. That's uh, something you can guarantee the printing um, quality. And also, um, after you have the PCB, you want to bring in to manufacturing, you need to have the stencils. It's uh, very similar to the silk screen printing. But now you, you are printing with a uh, uh, shoulder. And uh, for each of the products, you might have a different stencil. That causes a lot of uh, waste, but it's very critical. And we have also a room of all the stencils used and uh, expired. And uh, you might be very clear about the active passive components, but uh, I don't have enough time to explain into more details. <coughs> One rule is try to use the uh, popular components. Where can you find the popular components? One simple way is to find the most popular open hardware board. You see what components they are using and then try to reuse the components they use. Like for example, Atomica 328. That's something you, wa you might want to share. And for the regular resistors, capacitors, that should be no problem. But if you choose a button, try to use very standard, very popular button, or you might be jammed for a damn button. Uh, we have some example here is we try to calculate. We, among the projects we have done, the most uh, popular 100 components, they consist uh, averagely 30% 30, 30 of the bio materials, which means uh, sharing the library can sharing the supply chains. They can reduce cost, lead time, quality, and it's a way for people to share the knowledges. Um, like Exprino, it was a project we have done for a Kickstarter campaign before a long time ago. It starts from uh, P, uh, PO, our order, to shipping for some pieces in only 20 days. The only reason is that the, he uses a lot of the common, um, very popular parts. We'll go into more details and uh, we have a uh, um, new library called OpenPath Library, and also our friend Octopus, they created OpenPath Library. You will always try to uh, work with the community to select the most popular one. And also we will have more standardized accessories because they're too standardized. If for small volume, you don't worry about them. But if you are in a larger volume, you might um, have find the 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 uh, suitable factory and make long-term delivery plan with them and to make sure all the qualities aligns your specification and also packaging is something that you cannot avoid and, and it will totally affect but it's not the importance of our uh, topic today but remember it's uh, also part of your biomaterials you might want to include the static plastic bag you want to include the stickers, everything into your biomaterials. Or you might be waiting for them to get the whole project. And then for customized projects, um, I can give you an example that um, we're trying to align the mass, produ um, 
the mass factories with uh, our laboratory, which means if we can customize in our own equipment, and we find the, the factory has thousands of the same equipments, it's much easier for the customer's pipe, uh, customized parts to get it duplicated. And also for injection molding, I think it's a very painful process to introduce, so we leave it for some other time. And uh, finally, imagine that we are uh, cookers, we are chef. We have all the ingredients lying on the table. And the, the light mare, the real nervous moment has come, is whenever you assemble. Only by assemble you can find a lot of the mistakes. You can understand, oh, I have bought the wrong mat materials. Uh, it's not fun. And if you look at the whole assembly and test process, you can be, they, they can be very complex. But why are we doing assembly and test? Is that you don't want to do it yourself. You have to make these tasks as easy, as repeatable as possible, and give someone you don't know to accomplish them. And if people don't know you, they need to follow some programs. It's you, we are actually talking with all the files, with all the SOP, standard operation procedures, to make sure we have the right deliverables which match our expectation. So it's very important and we need to respect the whole progress or you will be um, affected by what you have studied. Okay, another little video. So this is how we set the test onto the PCB board. The first layer is the stencil and uh, the soldier will just go down to uh, infiltrate into the PCB itself. So that's very simple. But it's, this also requires a lot of precisions. And the way you do the stencil might affect the result. And uh, to pick and place machine, and also for reflow. So you might have already seen the pick and place machine. They're actually doing something very simple, is put the components onto the PCB, which has already the solder paste. But imagine that you have to put so many components onto so many PCB, and to make, to make sure they have the same result, to make sure they are fast enough to save time, to make sure they don't make stupid mistakes. <laughs> so you will see on the screen they have some uh, uh, optic alignment with your smart point. And this is a pick and place height. Sorry, because it's uh, a bit um, dark. So on the bottom of the screen, there are actually real some components. Please, uh, if you have time, watch the video over and over again because you will know how the machines work and on the other on the other hand you can design according to performances according to the behavior of the uh, machines so whenever i finish pick and place they are like glued to the pcb they will do a visual inspection to make sure most of the things are right but uh, they are like an uh, upgrade, they need to be cooked. And if there are something um, like big, too big to fit into the PM place machine, sometimes for small volume, we use a hand manually to put them onto the board again. And that's the uh, oven. It's, a, it's actually an oven, but with more precise temperature control. After going through the oven, they, we, act, we mostly finish the assembly process because all the components are in place with the electronic circuit board. And they will do a, again the QC check. I will show you some examples why do we need to do so many uh, steps to control quality. So as we just uh, expand, the, the reflowing oven is an oven. 
So it has, a, but it's the difference is they have several zones. Actually, uh, the more heating zones the reflowing oven has, it can be controlled more precisely. So it has preheatings to make sure they are warming up, and the thermothoke so to make sure um, all the components they are warm up to an extent that ready to be reflowed. And the, in the okay, I, I don't think I'm going to explain so much about that because that you, you can dig into the details, but that won't affect much about what you have done for design. But it's good to know. And also we, more important is for us to understand the issues. We are um, sorting the issues. The biggest issue for SMT is like tone. The, the SMT that should align perfectly on the surface, but sometimes one end comes up because the components might not match the dimension of the actual design, which means the PCB, the footprint, does not fit into the component itself. So you make sure the pad matches the package of the components. And also we have some uh, side soldering, which means the soldering is not stable, is not totally uh, heated. The cost is actually the pitch, they are uh, not matching the components' dimensions. And also there are some two hole pads that cause uh, uh, in equity of the, the physical elements. So the solution is to design from actual packages and to avoid <coughs> holes of the pad. So from this, we can see a lot, a lot of the QC process is, is to check out, to find out the, these issues. But the reason you should cause these issues are from your design. So um, you might get the, your design working in first piece. But imagine in the long run, in a more complex process on the other side of the planet, they might have more issues than you expected. And also we have more problems, like there is no mark on the pants. So uh, there might be some errors if we um, have to process manually. And there might be some mismatch between design and the pants, causing um, some problems in the manufacturing. So um, these are some specific cases, but uh, generally speaking, I think we need to have some compassion for machines. Machines are not slaves, they are our partners, they are helping ourselves. So we need to understand how the machines work and we comply ourselves to try to collab collaborate with the machines to make sure our designs can be very easily done by the machines. From that, we can have one more tips, which is we need to align the same components in, in adjacent order. For example, we can see from the video, the pick and, the pick and place machine actually are getting the components from the reels and then put them onto the board. So if you are talking to the same reels, they can be much faster than switching to different ones. And uh, you, we'll try to leave enough margin to the edge of the PCB because there will be some, uh, you will see some belt on the edge of the, uh, <coughs> the belt, there might be some uh, grippers. So if you put the components too close to the edge, they might be uh, moved. And also <coughs> you will see that during the video, in the, inside of the video, um, we're actually soldering them on one side, which means if you put the components, even if it's one component on the other side, we need to do it over again. So let's try to put all the SMD parts on one side of the board. And uh, especially for the open hardware community, we are having more through hole soldering than everyone else. It's easy for hand soldering to verify in the very beginning of the process, but it's actually difficult. This is a semi auto through hole soldering machine. I don't need to explain to you how to solder them because you can do it yourself, but it's actually a solder part. All the boards, whenever they're placed in the right spot, they sink into the heated uh, solder and come out. <coughs> So we, we always see that electronic manufacturing is very close to cooking. 
it's a part that actually makes this mature. It has to stay in the hot soda for quite a while. You will see the smokes. They are crying, but that's their destiny. And for a while, they come up again. Okay, perfectly um, soldered, or we can say it's like glued. And be sure to wear some gloves because it's very hot. And uh, I think the process are evolving as well because you cannot avoid. You sometimes you have the two big components. Sometimes you have the pin headers, and uh, we have some automatic soldering machine, and this is one of them. So this is <clears throat> this is like robots. Um, you may see that uh, they require some specific fixtures, and you also need to program it. Okay, I can watch it over and over again. So for through her through her soldering, we have also a lot of pains, like. Uh, um, Oh, I, I didn't add it is uh, a more usual way is wave soldering. It's very much like the oven. There's a belt. It comes in. There are hot solder underneath. So some of, sometimes the components cannot be wave soldered because they are <coughs> their design might affect the, the process. And sometimes the soldering, the components cannot be soldered by hand because uh, there is uh, there are run through hole dimensions. The holes are too small that you cannot insert the components inside. Or maybe you are buying different benches of the components that they cannot fit into your old designs. So you need to make sure <coughs> the all the dimensions they align. And also there might be too short this short distance between two components. And they might even either it's for machine or for human beings, it's difficult to solder. And uh, also there are some tilted uh, parts after wave soldering. You might need to strengthen them by some tabs or by some uh, extra um, support. So for DFM, I think if we can come back, to, if there is another chance for you to design, you need to keep space for each components, at least 0 0.5 millimeters. And uh, you need to ensure the space is able, is enough for manually soldering, repairing, or even Verify, and more importantly, please avoid through hole soldering if you can, because it it really does not fit for mass productions. <clears throat> I think um, we can have like a ten minutes break here. We can extend. Uh, we can come back about uh, one about ten. I don't. Know, I don't know time, but. Uh, it's like uh, uh, 23 o'clock. Yeah, we come back in 10 minutes. And we can keep can, posting can. the promise. Yeah. OK? OK. okay. Um, but, but how long do you think we were? I think, uh, we're missing uh, from um, I think we can finish it in another 20 minutes. Okay, we're trying to. Or, or I think we just uh, go on. Yeah, I think we should yeah, go on. I think it's better. Okay. Because it's okay. one single video. One single video. Yeah. Okay, so so, uh, so anyone it's who okay for you. excuse from lesson skill for yourself, and uh, I will uh, <laughs> carry on. So uh, the chapter four. Thank you. Uh, is we come to a test and package, which is actually uh, sort of to the end of the whole process. Um. Very importantly, why do we need to, to test? There are quite some projects come over to us and uh, 
they didn't know what is a test plan. They didn't know how to verify their plans. It's just, oh, just assemble them and send back to me. But uh, it's very, very critical in the whole manufacturing process to have the test. And how is test made? They actually, if we see all the tests simply, they actually control how to activate your circuit to make it working. And also you need to give uh, um, some simulations. It's actually like uh, giving a we are Google to the circuit board to make sure understanding, oh, I'm doing this. Then, and we output some results. You need to judge if the result matches um, what you have uh, expected. It's very simple, but the reality is very complex. This is before we do mass uh, production. We need to do a lot of verifications to make sure the first sample, they will be working. But this is just a start. We will have some performances. We have some functionalities we need to verify. But you need to design a plan to accomplish that. There are so many test methods and the priorities. Priority means how important it is to us, supposedly to the uh, simple open hardware projects. Um, PCB inspection systems, there'll be like e-test, there'll be some visual inspection. We don't need to worry much about that because they are usually done by suppliers. Secondly, there'll be ICT, it's called Instant Security Test. It's very common for simple projects and it will be, we have used a lot of them and you might be using that. And always, also we have some functional testing they are more for complex projects like IC or um, wireless things. And also for complex logic systems, you might have some JTAG, boundary scan testing. Um, I think if you have some system like Android uh, project, you might be using that because you, there's a very uh, difficult way to, for you to measure all the memories, etc. But uh, for issue test, you need to combine some of the testings to make sure you cover all aspects of your project. So what is a good test plan? <clears throat> I think I have uh, asked some experts and they don't give me a good answer. I'm trying to summarize like this. So a good test plan is actually a killer. It's a good killer of defects. The most important rule is like a firewall, no under queue. And the queue means it's a defect, but uh, the test plan does not tell it's a defect. And let it go. So it has to make sure it, it excludes all the defects. But uh, whenever you have uh, all the test means to make sure the quality, but uh, you don't want to have too much overqueue. Uh, overqueue means you, um, it's a good project, it's a good um, product. But uh, you might have seen some threshold too tight, or it might be disturbed by um, external elements that you think is wrong. So we need to be the better is the best is we we examine <laughs> the units with once and it, we tell the good from the bad for once. And the testing has to be fast. It's very important that we don't want to in the manufacturing floor to use half an hour to test one device. You need to have all kinds of means to fasten the process of testing. And it has to be easy because the operators, they are not engineer yet. They don't know what they are thinking. They don't know your product because they might be working with so many projects. So it has, it, the best is to have as easy as possible, like one button result. Good, no good, that's it. And uh, the test plan has to be cheap because test plan are usually uh, the test jigs, the fixture, the SOP, the operations, how to do that, and the program. Especially for the test fixture, you don't want to spend too much money on that because you might make a lot of them to manufacture more of the products. For example, if you, we might have uh, very fast PK and place machines, but whenever you are testing them, how fast can you test 1,000 pieces, 10,000 pieces? One um, test picture might not be enough. 
you might have you might need a 10 or you might need to penalize your products so that the test picture can uh, test 10 pieces at one time for example so bear this in mind and this is uh, the legendary test jig there's no rocket science inside you open it up it might be just an Arduino and to the left of you uh, to the left is what you see when it's operating it's better to have some buttons the uh, basic UI I know you guys are not very good at that and also you better to have some screen or maybe in the future we have some uh, um, wireless <laughs> network to collect the results and uh, what we should hear is uh, uh, handle so it's a manual testing fixture it's cheap but uh, whenever it goes large volumes it can be automatic and uh, I suggest in the future you might want to design the test fixture as you are designing the product so the test fixture can be as simple as Arduino with some uh, special <coughs> circuits to measure the input the output the voltage current etc and you can use uh, some laser cutter CNC to make the box to you know um, you can make it much cooler this is just uh, some enclosure we get from the local supplier and the uh, the most precise thing is on the test bed it's like needles on the bed but you need to very precise holes to make sure they match to your product and uh, here is the packaging with uh, the standard operation procedure please don't forget the packaging is something you also need to design very carefully because it will affect a lot on how to assemble them and how to uh, ship them to protect the product, to make it good looking, to, for, for your user to do a good unboxing. Uh, I'm not seeing the packaging for iPhone is a good one because it's taking too long. It's, it's more than just to put things into a box. You need to put them in a sequence. And you need to make sure everything is placed in the right direction. People might make mistakes, but we can design to make sure nobody can make mistakes. So, um, sorry, this is be jumping. So for the testing, sometimes we cannot make a test jig because there's no test plan for design. We need to really consider it. And for just we can see the assembly is a process, and uh, we need to make sure that we not only uh, the designer ourselves we do it um, by ourselves, but we. We could also ask someone else to do the assembly according to your given instructions to make sure they are executable. And for packaging, um, people might not know how to package them because there's no clear instructions. And also we meet a lot of unreasonable packaging methods. So generally, for assembly and test, we will try to involve less process, which means if we can avoid through whole assembly, we don't do through whole, and uh, we make each process count. And also, we need to have the SOP standard operation procedure. It's very critical. It's like programming. This might be impolite, but you are actually programming someone else to make sure he follows your um, expectation to accomplish the manufacturing process of course they can work they can help you to improve it but you need think in, the, in their shoes and uh, we try not to invent in the process unless there is a very critical reasons and uh, whenever we are manufacturing in large volumes 
we'll do a pilot run, like for manufacturing for small volume, like 100 pieces. But don't expect the pilot run will expose every error because it's just 100 pieces. And uh, it might only cover a small fraction of the basic problems. And uh, there is a doom. Whenever there might be problem, you avoid it, there will be problem. So don't overlook any possible risks. And uh, we, OK, thanks, Thomas, for <laughs> coming to our takeaway. So let's go back to the whole process. It's actually the three steps. We need to do the, the designing to prepare for the engineering. It might take one to 30 days because there might be unclear boom because the process tolerance is too, um, is too different from manufacturing. We cannot manufacture them. And there are usually inadequate test plans. Whenever the engineering is ready, we do the setup. We buy the components. That's, that's causing a lot of delays because of the long lead time components they might take a few months to buy. And also we have consistency problems. Consistency problem means you are buying 100 like uh, a school, but the schools, they are not like each other. And also sometimes we have two complex supply chains that they, we need a lot of logistic issues to make sure they arrive in the same place in the same time, like reporting to the customs to make sure they follow um, a lot of standards. Whenever we are doing manufacturing, it's actually quick. Um, it can be three days, sometimes it can be even uh, like half a day, because there are so many unexpected errors that might cause a delay up to two weeks. And uh, very usually for the small bench, for the initial bench, you will have no yield. Means you are manufacturing like 1,000 units, and you only have 500 out of them. And also, uh, you might have uncontrollable assembly time because the also SOP is not clear enough. The assembly process is not easy enough. So it's a very difficult uh, process to bring the prototype into uh, product. But uh, as long as we respect for the um, elements, it can be done easier and easier than before. So we, if we can categorize the things we need to do and what the suppliers need to do, uh, you can refer to the chat. Uh, I think I'm not going to read them, but I need to um, watch the slides afterwards. And you really need to consider in the shoes of a supplier to make sure what you have delivered, they can start something good. And the uh, tips, again, for indie products for several thousands, there are five simple tips. First is we need to balance cost, quality, schedule. And then we need to consider the overall cost. It's not only the material cost, it's everything. It's only, it's, it, in, it also includes your time. And then we need to use the popular components to avoid all the risks or the problems. Also, we try to involve fewer processes as possible. And uh, this might be a stereotype, but uh, please try to use SMD components if possible. OK, uh, we, I'm not sure I have the right to leave some homeworks, but I will leave you some practices, and you may try to do that. So. I have done this in the last Open Hour Summit. Um, it's a very important process to try manufacture something yourself. Let's start with something easy. I believe you, there are a lot of good designers among you guys. And let's re, how about let's redefine the hat. We can put more people in. Um, into different teams, or if you are in an app, you can divide into several teams. But I need to worry about these things, the cost. How many basic materials per hand you have used? And the volumes, how many hands you have manufactured? And also you need to 
keeps the consistency among the same batch. And also, you need to promise, which means what you have pitched to people, like what you have done on Kickstarter campaign, you need to actually give them something very close. You know what I mean. And also, you need to vote for the style to vote for, OK, this is uh, popular. So we, let's, let's start with something basic. Um, I believe you all have some A4 paper with you or around you. How about we take 20 pieces of A4 paper and with one adhesive tape. And we can also use anything else you can find, but don't do it illegal. And you use some uh, equipment, which are scissors, stapler, and use some color pens. Given this material and equipment, how can we manufacture? So I have done this workshop. It's like within one hour. So it's not too terrible uh, homework. You might spend uh, 15 minutes to design among your teams. And also you pitch to people, or you can just uh, leave some uh, message. What are you going to deliver to the people? And you need to spend only 20 minutes to manufacture the hands you want and try to manufacture as much as possible to make them consistent. You cannot make yourself because it's not fast enough. You have to teamwork. You have to authorize the job to someone else. So you need to have a very clear SOP to teach people how to turn IFO paper into the hands you want. So finally, we will have deliver. Like we can put all the hands together to get a picture. Are these hands have good quality? Are they matching what we have promised? So we will have more details in the objectives, but to save some time, I'm not going to more details. The major objective for design is uh, to make the first hat, the engineering sample, and for pitch, to sell the designs to the bankers, and for manufacturing, manufacture more, but make sure they have the good quality. And also show us the, re the results. You can share the results, the photos, thoughts via Twitter. To um, you can add the studio Twitter account, uh, hashtag Fusion to win. For anyone submit this, we will give you a free PCB uh, coupon. For the winner, we will give you a PCBA coupon for to for you to try the small batch and trolling manufacturing. So because I'm not uh, sure if I can give you homework, this is just a, a practice you can try. And uh, also, um, I think this lesson is coming to an end. Please have a good luck to the mess and don't make the mess into a mess. And also, I attached most of the component, component uh, information into the slides, which I have already shared in the Google uh, Plus group. And uh, I think we have some spare time as we, let me switch back into the video. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Thank Eric. You. I don't know if you noticed that, that, that Neil is just joining us. Just joining us. Hi, Neil. Hello, Neil. Hi, Hi, Neil. Neil. Hi, Hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. Long time. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, so we are in the middle of our factory. Sorry, say it again. Sorry, say it again. Oh, we are in the we are just inside our factory. So I choose this place to do the lecture because after the lessons, if people are interested, I can show you around the real machines and also the real things in the manufacturing floor to give you more in, uh, perspective. And also, uh, I'm open to more questions. I'm not sure I can answer all of them, but I will try. So I'll start. I have two questions, but to start, just do a quick pan around so we can see the scene where okay. you are. Yeah. So uh, let me try to. So because it's the middle light. And, uh, and also so, who you are with. Uh, here. Uh, yes. Uh, we start with the audiences. We have the Fab Lab students <laughs> from Shenzhen. Because they are so, uh, they don't want to go through VPN to Google Hangout and come back, so they, they move them, uh, move their atoms to our factory. So this is our factory, and uh, you will see they are also trying to do the homework of last session. Some of the sensei uh, are doing good, and some are not. And uh, also we will show you some of the uh, things we are manufacturing.
Oh, Eric, you're mute, and we lost your video. Oops. Give him a minute to come back. Yeah. Send him a note. How many viewers are there, Tomas? Uh, at the moment, uh, 95. That's great. Uh, the max was 110, actually. That, that's great. <laughs> You're back, Eric. OK, I'm back. Okay. So you will see, um, like this is uh, both hardly assembled. They are fresh. They are uh, ignorant. And also, we have the test uh, fixture, which we use this kind of uh, fixture to turn uh, electronic boards. And you will see it's uh, usually un uh, underneath is Arduino based, so people can change it very uh, easily. And uh, that's a live stencil we use to manufacture this board. And uh, um, you will see all the components used for them. They are a big hassle, but uh, we need to prepare them. It's like the ingredients for cooking. Let's say hi to the teams again. Hi. And uh, so a little quick pan around. That's the factory we are having, and uh, it's uh, empty because people are not working uh, over time, overnight. So and that's uh, that's the machine we're talking about. So this is where we put in the PCB board. And this is where we uh, put a soda uh, passed onto the board. It's silent. It's sleeping. And that's a pick and place machine. You see all the reels. Each of them is one component. And you will see more reels on the other side. And uh, you will see more like there are like magazines on the other side. So we uh, have a lot of spare component uh, reels because we uh, feeders we because we want to, to uh, shorten the process of uh, switching and you see all that's uh, our library of stencils. So each of them means one product and uh, this is uh, most of company use the uh, components, but I have suggested you guys is to try to reuse popular components as possible. And whenever it goes to okay, oh perfect. So here we see this is uh, um, this is some info for people to see the layout, and whenever they're putting the components onto the board, there are some marks like uh, they, to, they will match the components according to the bare materials, and here are like some uh, SOP. So it's the basic uh, operation uh, menu for people to follow, and uh, that's the that's the entrance to the hill, which will be headed to 300 or 200 to 300 uh, Celsius. So that's flow open. And uh, after the flow open, people will verify them. So you will see some uh, in-process border. Great. OK, let's get to some questions now. Yeah, 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 please. So first, what's the time? First, what time is that? Sorry? Uh, what time is it there? Oh, it's, uh, uh, it's 11 p.m. So we are we're having our Yuan Shao Festival, which is the middle night. Good. Th thank you for staying for us. So I have a smaller question and a bigger one. The, the smaller okay. one is uh, if somebody from the Fab Academy <laughs> wants to uh, work with you and Seed, to transition to commercialization, what's the right way to work with you? How should they contact Seed? Uh, I think in the future they have to go through the uh, the lecture first to understand all the problems for design for manufacturing. Right. And of course, they can contact us by so many means. They can just go to our website. Well, that's website. what I want to say. So they they've come to your lecture. They'll do a final project. They've been reviewed. Everything's nicely set. Um, what's the best way for them to contact Seed at that point? Uh, I'm joining the Google Plus uh, group. They can just find me there. Also, they can uh, 
uh, in the slide, I will leave a message, uh, a contact, a special email box so people can just write. Okay, good. Add that. Also, yeah, okay. also Neil, no, no, one comment on that is like we have one product actually going from the Fab Academy to see this Smart Citizen. We can oh, announce great. that. Right. Yeah. Okay, now here's the bigger question. Uh, Fab 12 is coming to Shenzhen. Oh, I, I forgot to say we'll come. Well, so but more was, than that. No, but that, that's too easy. I'm going to make it harder. Um, okay. You did a great job about talking, transitioning from prototype to mass manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The goal for me at Fab 12 is the transition to Fab Labs 2.0 of Fab Labs Make Fab Labs. Yep. And so if Fab Labs Make Fab Labs, and if Barcelona and all the other fab cities produce everything they consume, mm -hmm. there's still an important role for Shenzhen, but it's different. So you yep. did talk about the roadmap from mass to personal manufacturing. So if every city has rapid prototyping tools, um, today we send everything to you to make. Mm -hmm. In 20 years, we'll assemble the atoms. But okay. talk, talk a little bit about the roadmap from mass to volume personal manufacturing to distributed manufacturing to, yep. the, to the Fab 12 vision. I see. We, we believe very deeply on that as well. So that's why we established our first uh, uh, offshore manufacturing center in California. We were trying to do and more. As you might see on my back, there is a, a cell we call Cell Zero. It com it's a very small team that can do everything from electronics to mechanics and also to introduce the first engineering sample to 100 units. I think from 1 to 100 it should happen very close to the makers, to the Fab Lab um, neighborhoods. And then it can be ramped up with uh, established experiences. And uh, wow. it's also very important for the small volume manufacturing to match to the local needs. So we can make a smart smart table, but we don't need to manufacture everything offshore and ship it back. We can make the core components maybe in large volume, but dis distribute them into different uh, locations. And for example, in Barcelona, we use some wood and to make the very unique furniture, put the electronics inside, and that's something different. So we, we I think we definitely need to uh, explore the possibility to work with FAM2.0. FAM yeah, let me encourage you to stay in touch. Tomas is coordinating the emerging fab cities. The city is moving towards self-sufficiency. And so we're really sort of building this whole global fabrication on demand. Um, and so I, I think Fab 12 is both an opportunity and a homework assignment to get ready to support that. OK. okay. Yeah, um, we're 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 yeah. And, oh, that's my homework. OK. Yeah, that's your homework. And then here's okay. my last question. Um, you gave an impressive talk about what you can do. Um, what can't you do? What, what what limits you? What are you frustrated by? Uh, there are too many things um, I can't do because you see the manufacturing. If you look at things around us, I I always feel um, frustrated because we have been talking about the makers, FabLab for so many years, and there are so many things we still cannot do. You look at the TV underneath, we cannot manufacture it because it's too complex. But I think it needs a lot of more collaborations and to increase the process we can use and also to open up the supply chain so everyone can use that. And thanks to the economic recessions, we have more factories, supply chains who wants to open to work with independent product makers. I think it's a good trend and we are trying to push the trend further. And uh, answering to your questions, and uh, um, I think we are doing some uh, uh, the joint uh, area of different industries, but for each industry, they are very, very professional. We we'll try to uh, build synergies with them, and uh, so they, what they are good at is something we can't do and we don't need to do. Okay, good. Well, thank you for joining. I look forward to seeing you in Shenzhen. I'll now drop off and listen to the stream as Tom read, uh, Tomas reads questions uh, that have been posted. Okay. See you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil.
Thanks so much, uh, Eric. It was amazing, amazing talk and uh, a lot of synergies. I'm uh, people is starting to post to post questions. Um, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go first um, and, and before giving them some time for more questions. I want to maybe ask you about something that you showed me. You were starting last year when I visited you. Uh, the Internet of Things platform you were developing. Maybe you can you can talk about that a little bit. The data uh, like. Uh, the whole idea starts from a reform. Maybe you have uh, seen this one. Mm -hmm. So it's a modular phone. And uh, it's actually the toolkit that we want to create for uh, people to build their IoT stuff. And uh, this is just a start. We want to build more solutions. So people can just come to get the whole package and have something that, that is working. But uh, on all aspects from the electronics to software to magnets, they are open. So people can change it. And we want to lower the barrier for IoT because it was too difficult to go from atoms to cloud. And what okay. if we can give people something ready to use, like, like a template, like a WordPress, that you can just change it. So we are cooking more, and you can always look out, find us on Kickstarter, and we will be releasing more um, uh, IoT solutions this year. And of course, okay. please tell, us, tell me uh, what you want, and we will totally consider that. OK, that's fantastic. Another, another question that um, maybe for people to understand, and since you uh, founded like, the first makerspace in Shenzhen, uh, if you can tell us how many years ago you founded it, and uh, how many makerspaces there were in Shenzhen last year, and how many makerspaces are today, to understand well, <laughs> the growth. <laughs> uh, that's a very fun answer. I uh, started the makerspace in 2011. By that time, we were too lonely, and we come to California, and uh, we are too jealous about the makerspaces, and say, oh, why don't we do one? And I met some local makers. They don't know they are makers, but they are makers. So um, I used our previous office as a makerspace and open to the public. So that's where everything started. And we also uh, bring um, more events, more interactions. But uh, until, I think, one year ago, there were less than four makerspaces in Shenzhen. I think three. three. Mm -hmm. But after the premier minister came over, I think this year we have more than 200 in Shenzhen. <laughs> and we, we are checking the more than 200 <laughs> places called the makerspace in Shenzhen. Okay. And I am, I'm saying that um, maybe there are more makerspaces than makers. So <laughs> I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good place for me to say this. Um, in Shenzhen, we are totally in short of makers. Please come. <laughs> We're going to bring you, bring you more than probably around 2,000 Please. makers from the world <laughs> in August, yeah. for sure. So Anna is asking about the, the electronic furniture um, that uh, Seed is developing in collaboration with Barcelona. That was an example, Anna. Uh, but actually, it's, it's not existing yet, but probably it's something that we can do, no, Eric? A pleasure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if anyone has uh, more questions. I think we're, we're re reaching to our max of duration of a, of a Hangout. Please post uh, any questions if, if you are eager to ask something to Eric. Otherwise, um, do you know that we are going to visit you? Um, let, let's make a, 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 maybe a, an easy one. Uh, we will be able to visit Seed Studio while in Shenzhen. <laughs> okay, we will prepare some open days and exactly. workshops. We actually get ready Shenzhen for your visit. Well, I mean that, that brings a, uh, an interesting thing, which is uh, let's see what happens in the Fab Academy. We're we're expecting for this year to be the year in which um, more and more uh, developed and and let's say relevant projects will be created. We're really going to push for more and better projects. And it's going to be interesting connection with 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 Seed Studio, and I encourage um, the Fab Academy students to come with Chen, with to Shenzhen to with a with a business proposal probably to Seed Studio. So a, uh, a little update: what you are seeing here, I think it's the last week because we are moving to a new factory. You will, I will welcome you to our new factory, and also okay. uh, the makerspace will expand to a much bigger venue with more equipment. So, okay. and uh, and of course I will I will uh, talk with you how to make it 
sure the, the, the new mix space aligns with the Fab Lab to send us uh, to join the network. That's fantastic. So see you over, hope to see you all in Shenzhen. And whenever you guys are nearby, please drop us a message and we'll come to check out. Uh, and uh, feel free to write us emails, Twitter, Facebook. We are all um, open. And we live okay. beyond our wars. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And it's likewise, I mean, Thank for you. you, when you come back to Europe, Let's make sure we meet in Barcelona and somewhere else. Um, and thank you very much for joining the FAB Academy program. And uh, yep. we hope to see you very soon in Shenzhen. We're going to be there very soon. OK. Thank you. And okay. have a good day. Good night. Bye bye. OK. okay. Good and night. Have a good sleep. <laughs> bye, bye, guys. Good luck with your week assignment. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> cool. <laughs> bye. Bye bye, everyone. Have a good week.